50% of the damage to the climate is coming from industrial agriculture, but most people don't even think of food as an element in climate change. Part of it was they moved to energy because fossil fuel was energy. They said, okay, let's have alternative energy. Not remembering that the first energy is food. Food is energy. And for those of you with a little, little familiarity with Indian thinking, we don't just think in terms of energy, we think in terms of different forms of energy. There's the sattvic, which regenerates. The radsik, that excites. The tamsik, that makes it heavy. And that's the reason good food rejuvenates you. But good food is also sattvic for the planet. And I think it's only when those concerned with eating the right way and those concerned with climate change start to put food and how we grow it as a missing piece, we won't be able to address the problem. That's what I've been doing. When I looked at the data, not because I was looking at the data for climate change. You know, I made a clear choice in 92 at a convention on biological diversity and the, I wrote my, the speeches of my uh, ministers for the Earth Summit. But then I said, I'm going to give my time to the protection of life on Earth and biodiversity. And I'll save seeds because it, it was so urgent because, you know, the Monsanto lobbyists used to be in the corridors. And I said, these guys are evil. And so I'll put all my energy into biodiversity and seeds. And there are other friends who look at how many percentage increase is happening with the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Today, not only do we realize that 50% of the greenhouse gases come from an industrial food system that also gives us bad food, that is responsible for 75% of the chronic diseases, that when we shift to ecological agriculture and biodiversity-based systems, we are finding an answer to the climate change problem in two ways both by reducing the emissions, because if you're not using, if you're not destroying your small farms, you're not using heavy fossil fuel. When you're doing organic, you're, you're not using synthetic chemical fertilizers. When you have symbiotic relationships between farming families and animals and trees and crops, you don't have the methane emissions. And when you don't have these long distance chains and uniformity, you don't have food waste. I mean, in India, we've never known food waste. What we don't eat, the cow will eat. And what the cow won't eat goes into the compost, as I've seen in this lovely bin you've been composting. So why should there be food waste? Everything is food. Everything is something else's food. That's what our Vedas tell us. And my ecological learning has taught me that the web of life is a food web. And food is the currency of life. We even say Annam Brahman. Food is an embodiment of the divine. Therefore, give it respect. Therefore, be thoughtful about how you grow it. And in the Tetra Upanishad, it says, the growing and giving of good food is the highest dharma. And the growing and giving of bad food is the highest adharma, the equivalent of sin. Food is at the heart of the right way to live on this planet. So when we do organic farming, we are literally taking the excess nitrogen out of the atmosphere and through the nitrogen fixing crops, putting it back in the soil. So you keep talking about pr plant-based proteins. The same plant-based proteins are nitrogen fixers. And they fix atmospheric nitrogen in a very non-violent Gandhian way. Not the violent militarized way of making synthetic fertilizers. Every time photosynthesis happens, 
living carbon is being created. And carbon is not the problem. The dead carbon is the problem. That's why I constant, when they say decarbonize, Bill Gates keeps saying we have to decarbonize the planet. I say, Mr. Gates, you'll be totally dead if you're decarbonized because we are living carbon. Our food is living carbon. The planet is living carbon. It's the dead carbon that's the problem. And we need more living carbon and zero dead carbon. So when every time there's a little leaf that's growing, it's doing photosynthesis, it's fixing the atmospheric carbon, putting it back into the soil where it belongs, pulling it out of the atmosphere where the excess doesn't have to build up. We have proven ways, both in nature as well as in 10,000 years of farming and the future, 10,000 years of good ecological farming and good ecological food production, we have ways to heal the broken carbon cycle and the broken nitrogen cycle that are at the root of climate change. Now, the interesting thing is when on the tweet, my one tweet that's getting blocked is when I explain the simple phenomena of how plants can heal the planetary destruction. There's a panic because they don't want you to know that you can work with nature to address these problems because they want to have geoengineering to blast artificial volcanoes. They want geoengineering to pollute the atmosphere with chemicals, and they call it cooling the planet. And I've had debates with some of these brilliant scientists, many of them are Nobel laureates, and I say, but when you so-called cool the planet by putting a layer of pollution, A, you're doing exactly what the problem is, because the greenhouse gas Gases are creating a layer of pollution, and that's why the problem. How do you expect that same pollution to now be a solution? But more importantly than that, when you've blocked out the sunshine, what on earth is going to happen to our agriculture, to our food, to our trees? Oh, I don't look at that. It's not in my project, and that's part of the problem. That science has become so reductionist, and so fragmented and so much in tiny linear boxes that it doesn't see the relationships and doesn't take responsibility for them. I did physics inspired by Einstein. And for him, responsibility was a central piece of the creativity of science. That you could not separate the technical dimensions of using a tool and the ecological and social dimensions of the consequences of the use of that tool. That was all part of one action. And you were responsible for it. I remember President Bush had a favorite program that um, didn't go through then. He wanted to put reflectors in the sky to send the sunshine back. And I remember writing a piece at that time. I said, the sun is a blessing, not a problem. The problem is the pollution that's preventing the sun from coming here yeah, and the heat of the sun to escape again. So we have this disease of constantly naming life as the problem and the extinguishing of life as a solution to every problem we've created by harming life in the first place. If you move from the climate disaster to the soil disaster, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity has said that the degradation of land is the single biggest urgent issue because it is dislocating, dispossessing people and their refugees all over the world now. Now, but three years ago, it was the year of soil. I'm on an international commission on the future of food that was started by the president of the region of Tuscany, um, Claudio Martini, at that time. And this international commission meets a few, every few years to address a key issue. And we produce a manifesto. We call it manifesto for fun. We're not writing a mass line. We're not expecting I mean, We do it for clarity. We did a manifesto on the seed, on the food, on climate change, on the knowledge systems. When the 2008 Wall Street collapse happened, we did a manifesto on knowledge because the crisis is a core crisis of knowledge. And in the year of soil, 
not only was it a year of soil, but it was the year where all these boats were crossing the Mediterranean and they were sinking. There's an island in Italy called Lampedusa then. Now the crisis has moved to Greece because more refugees are coming from Syria. It's a, we've got to make sense of, of this explosion in the refugee crisis in the context of soil. And we had the former Secretary General of the UN Convention on Desertification. I don't think you even know about it because the New York Times won't cover this convention. There's a convention on land degradation and desertification. And Luke was part of this group of experts. And together we wrote and we, we focused then on two cases of the link between the refugees and the soil. The first was Africa, where one of the biggest lakes, Lake Chad, had shrunk from 22,000 square kilometers to nothing. Why is the water gone? Because 80% of the water in, from the rivers that feed this lake is being diverted for commercial commodity agriculture for international trade. So the lake's drying up. But there are people, 9 million people, who depend on the lake as fishermen, as pastoralists, as farmers. And as the water starts to shrink, conflict starts. I did a book for the United Nations called Ecology and the Politics of Survival on Conflicts Over Natural Resources, way back in the 80s. That so many conflicts that are named religious are actually conflicts over a damaged earth and trying to find your little bit of water, your little bit of land, your little bit of food. The Arab Spring, the UN recognized the Arab Spring was really about bread because when they started to march, they were marching with bread. The vendor who killed himself in Tunisia was a vegetable vendor who was being made illegal to sell vegetables under these new safety norms. It was a bread revolution. So of course, the conflict really was between different communities losing their livelihood. But because of the way Africa has been colonized, the pastoralists have stayed Islamic and the settled agriculturists were converted to Christianity. So instead of seeing that it's two communities desperate over disappearing water, it was named a religious conflict and Boko Haram and everything else came out of it. My book on the violence of the Green Revolution shows exactly this trajectory of conflicts in the Punjab in 1984. And take Syria, 2009, they'd had a very severe drought. Before that, they'd have the Green Revolution like India. And Green Revolution requires 10 times more water to grow the same amount of food. So they had mined all their groundwater. And the rain didn't come. A million peasants became refugees. Their livestock died. They moved to the cities. But the World Bank structural pro adjustment prevents governments from supporting farmers. You can subsidize agribusiness, but you can't support your farmers. So the government was not allowed to support the farmers. And then within two years, the arms started to flow. And the war of Syria, which is a war without end, who's fighting whom, nobody knows anymore. But half of Syria is refugees. Half of Syria. Fertile Crescent, the agriculture started. And if you start making a map of how many regions are being devastated, both directly by the attack on the earth and indirectly by attack on the economies that are sustained by the earth and the livelihoods, that map is the map of the world we are living in. And land and water crises that are created on the ground and are linked to the greenhouse gas emissions also create vulnerability. The same systems that contribute to climate change are more vulnerable to climate change. Our work in Navdanya has found that the more diverse your system, the more easily you can deal with a drought. The more organic matter in your soil, 
the more you can deal with water scarcity. 0.5% organic matter, that's all. 0.5% organic matter can contribute 80,000 liters to soil, you'll never have a drought. Because your soil becomes the reservoir. And what makes it a reservoir is the making of humus with the mycorrhizal fungi and the aggregation of soils. The soil therefore becomes like a sponge, holds the water. And then the rains might fail, but your soil will grow your crop. And just like in all other inputs, whether it's fertility or it's controlling pests with pesticides, with water we've forgotten that the soil is a source of water. And we're thinking in irrigation is the only way we'll get water. And so in this country you've mined the Olagala Africa, uh, aquifer. In India the land of Punjab, the land of five rivers, is today under a severe water crisis. And it's said in 10 years time they might have no water. And in fact the problems of Punjab were water conflicts. 20 engineers had been killed for building a canal that would take the water out of Punjab to other states. It's often said the wars of the future will be around water. I say today's wars are also around water. I wrote a book on this called Water Wars because so many of India's rivers are now sources of conflict, whether it may be the Suffrage or the Kaveri or the Krishna or the Godavari. And when we have our national anthem, we think of all these rivers as our river goddesses. And because we violated them today, instead of nourishing us, they become the source of conflict. And of course, we are polluting them with water pollution from chemicals being a major source. Now, this polluting industrial farming that gives us 75% chronic diseases and also is destroying 75% of the life support of the planet and 50% of the climate balance, it gives us only a pathetic 30% of the food we eat and that too is bad for our health, 30%. The small farms, the small farms give us 70% of the food we eat, and this is FAO data, the Food and Agriculture Organization data. In fact, they say, this year they say 80%. Till last year they were saying 70%. 70%, 80 of the food we eat comes from small farms that are only 20% of the land. Only 20% of the land. Now, if you take the 30% that's destroying 75%, of the planet and you enhance it through the force and the brute force with which it's being imposed, I deal with it daily in my country. All kinds of new tricks. The latest being, oh, you don't have to farm anymore, take 17 rupees a day, 17 rupees a day. That's five cents a day. And live in a land of in a world of privatized water privatized electricity privatized education privatized health and you don't grow your own food this direct payment issue came out of agribusiness in this country at the beginning of the world trade organization discussions it's now arriving in india and the and monsanto has said now they're going to be farming without farmers with drones in the sky spyware in the tractors Tractors that don't have drivers, driverless tractors. Everyone's going crazy about driverless tractors. We don't need tractors in the first place. And so all of it, I mean, the three convergences, you know, we should be having a convergence of human life and the rest of life on this planet. Our food and the food system and the food web. What we are getting a convergence of is the destructive technologies and their power. The destructive chemical technologies that became the biotechnologies and the control over seed. The destructive control over money that they now call FinTech, just because 5G is part of it. They just put tech behind anything and expect us to sit back and say, we won't ask a question. We won't resist. No, if you're threatening our freedom and our life, 
we will resist in the non-violent ways in which Gandhi taught us. That resisting brute force and the theft of our freedom is our duty for being on this earth. And the third that becomes part of it is the information technologies. They're working very hard in the World Trade Organization to have zero taxes. So Amazon anyway steals taxes, but now they want to legally have a right to pay no taxes. So here you have a regime that's taken 99% of the wealth of the people, concentrated it in the hands of few, they're integrating amongst themselves. There's no boundaries between them anymore. And they want to pay no taxes. This is the debate in your country. This is the debate in my country. I believe anything that harms the earth, anything that harms our health, anything that is against democracy should be taxed. Polluter pays. It's a law. The polluter should pay, including the 5G pollution, it's a different kind of pollution, but it is into electromagnetic pollution. And the mining of our minds, I mean, look at what Facebook did. It mined our data, sold it to Cambridge Analytica, which then sold it to the political system. And as is often said, the first artificial intelligence president you have in the White House now. Because artificial intelligence put him there, not the people. And this convergence is part of what we have to deal with. 